Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, everyone. My dear friend, how are you? Hi, Neva. Hi there. How are oh, you? Oh, can I say that I really miss you, everyone? Some of you might have noticed that I wasn't here in the last two sessions. I was away for a research project, but now I'm back. Hope you all enjoyed. Uh, let me see. Can I move this? Yes. Hope you all enjoyed our XFAL lecture without borders so far. In the last four months, we already had 11 very high quality lectures together. And this is our 12th lecture, the last session for this summer. Of course, for some of you, it could be the last session for the winter, depends where you are. We always amazed by how international our audience are. When we come last time, I remember the number was over, over 50, I think. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for your trust and also for your contribution. If you are new here, very welcome. And don't worry if you feel like you missed out something because um, you can always go to our website to assess the previous lectures or potentially you can go to our uh, YouTube channel where all the lectures and associated uh, videos are available for you, okay? So um, before we welcome our speaker, Dr. Um, Nelva Bryant, and begin our topic today, can I quickly um, going to introduce our XVAL consultation with our border platform? Uh, I'm not sure if our panda has introduced it before, probably a little bit. Um, I know this name is quite long, uh, consultation with our border platform. We're just not creative enough to uh, have a better name. So if you have any good suggestion with the name or the function required, please, please let us, us know in the chat box or mention in the feedback form, which I will distribute at the end of this lecture. Um, so the rationale behind this consultation platform it's actually very simple. Um, first, we hope that you can create, uh, you can reach more experts all over the world with a minimum cost. Um, because over the times we found out that within a two, two uh, hour lecture, although it is free, we can never answer all our participants' questions. For some lecture, there are over 200 questions. So it's impossible for us to carry all, um, to cover all, yeah? So we have been thinking about how to address that. So with this platform, we hope that you can reach the exact person, the expert that you want and have uh, some in-depth discussion and consultation with them. The second rationale is that we really need to value our expertise. It's not only some professors at the Oxford University are experts, the concept of expertise is actually relative. So that professor in the UK may are making every effort and want to pay a lot of money to understand a rare disease here, but which can actually be a very common issue in some area in the Africa. So a medical student in, in Nigeria, for example, can easily answer his questions and solve some samples. So isn't that great? I think we really need kind, this kind of um, consultation platform with our borders orders. So um, we hope it can be an uh, accessible and affordable solution for everyone because accessible and affordable are always the key value for XVAL. So this is um, a platform for like human medical, for veterinary medicine, um, for um, career advice, business operations, or even human resource outsourcing. So um, I actually had used it for a couple of times. We, for example, we just got um, a little puppy for the first time. So I have a lot of silly questions to ask. <laughs> uh, so for example, how to get along with our neighbor's cat. And to be honest, I'm very pleased with the detailed answer that I received. And the reserve is very affordable, as you can see, um, many, many um, actually service charge only five US dollars. So I really do encourage, encourage you to have a look and hopefully can register and open your first virtual clinic or consultation during this pandemic. So um, to help you to learn about that, we opened our, 
um, XVAL consultation without border competition. <laughs> yeah, so um, during, you can find more detailed information on our website as well. Um, during this, if you have any assistant, uh, uh, question that want to um, have any assistance and help, just let us know our XVAL doc or, or Panda will do their best to help you, yeah. So um, sorry, I probably talked too much. I wasn't here for two sessions, so so I have too much to share. Um, let's go to our most important um, topic today. Yeah, today we feel very honored to have Dr. Nelva Bryant with us. She used to be serve uh, uh, be serving at the Delta's Industry First Staff Veterinarian. She is an expert in the veterinary involvement in the airline industry. She now is the founder of the DVM Transportation Consultants. This uh, is a consultation form that is available for supply service to airlines, veterinarians, and animal owners. So the service they provide including animal transportation policy analysis or um, assisting with um, veteran veterinarians with their preparation for the paths for domestic and international air travel. Um, although we know that during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, paths as well as majority of people are not traveling on airlines in many countries now, um, but it is a very good opportunity to get ready for the future airline travel to ensure all the animals can arrive their destinations safely. So in today's lecture, now I want to discuss with you that how having natural involvement in the airline industry could benefit animal welfare. Oh, so um, thank you very much. Um, 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 so just to let you know that if you have problem accessing this Zoom uh, lecture, we are also um, have stream session uh, at the same time on our Twitter account. So you know where to go. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, hi, Neva. Can can you hear me? So stage yes. is yours. Hi there. Uh, hi to can everyone. You with Hello everyone. Let me um, let me share my um, screen and. And we'll go from there. Great. Uh, good morning if you're here in the United States and good evening or good afternoon where if you are somewhere internationally. I really honestly appreciate this opportunity here to present my thoughts uh, to improve uh, animal transportation um, and basically ensuring they arrive to their destination safely. My, my presentation really is gonna be primarily focusing upon pets, although this information I'm sharing also could, can be applied to other animals, uh, zoo animals and what have you. Um, I am, at least I consider myself an airline industry veterinarian. I am a veterinarian basically working in the airline industry. I am the founder of DVM Transportation Consultants and um, thank you for uh, sharing the information about that for me. Um, prior to COVID-19, I served as Delta's Airlines first industry first staff veterinarian. And within that role, I was allowed to uh, focus on the air travel of pets and other animals. Uh, gain insight into the transportation process and the industry itself, uh, and also to determine ways to ensure pets or animals arrive to their destinations safely. I presented my observations at um, major veterinary conferences and um, through webinars in 2019 and 2020. And just so you know a little bit of background about myself, um, I received my DVN and completed a veterinary pathology res residency at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, so I started with uh, really wanting the desire to be a pathologist, but um, I guess with experiences, uh, I learned to pivot and take on other opportunities as I uh, went along within my career. I received an MPH at an MPH uh, at, at uh, I'm sorry at the University of Iowa MPH for practicing veterinarians program. Um, I've got plenty of clinical practice experience that I would do part-time on, and on the weekends as a relief veterinarian. Um, I also uh, 
retired, I'm a retired Lieutenant Commander in the United States Public Health Service. Um, that experience allowed me to work in multiple federal agencies throughout the United States. Um, and the last 12 years of my career, I was at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and I served as a chief veterinary pathologist, uh, another role as a veterinary public health consultant, and then finally as a quarantine veterinary medical officer, where I was a dog importation SME. It's during the last few years at, C at CDC is where I uh, got an insight into the airline industry and was very interested in moving forward with that and was uh, blessed to have the to be chosen to work with Delta after I retired from CDC. So my purpose for today really is to uh, provide an overview of the present air transportation process and show how veterinary involvement could benefit the, the process itself, promote animal welfare, and ensure animals arrive to their destination safely. Uh, before I get going into that, I just want to make everyone aware um, the transportation of live animals by cargo uh, is, is regulated by multiple, there's multiple regulations and policies that must be complied with for an animal to get to their destination safely. Um, the International Air Transportation Association, which is IATA, has live animal regulations. It's actually, they have a manual that um, has all the shipper and the carrier responsibilities is, is kind of detailed out within the manual. As far as the shipper responsibility, there's a specific shipping container requirements that must be met for each animal species. And um, so they define that for everyone. And, and um, then also within the United States, there's USDA animal welfare, which uh, animal welfare, which enforces the Animal Welfare Act. And these regulations apply to pets being transported by cargo. And they will define the crate size requirements, uh, food and water requirements, temperature limit restrictions, and also um, whether an animal needs a letter, uh, a pet needs a letter of acclimation. And that occurs when, if the temperature goes over, is below a certain degrees Fahrenheit, 45 degrees Fahrenheit to be specific. Each airline has their own individual policies in place, which may be uh, embargoing certain breeds based upon them being brachycephalic or snub-nosed breeds or sizing of the animals, so airline policies vary also. And then uh, we have the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, if there's ever an injury, uh, loss or death of a pet during transport by cargo, all U.S. airlines have to uh, report this information to the Department of Transportation. Then the cases are sent over to USDA Animal Welfare for them to investigate the situation. And also the U.S. Department of Transportation makes policy regarding the transport of pets in cabin. One interesting thing about all this is that even though IATA has their standards here, there's no regulatory oversight to mandate compliance with uh, ensuring that the shipper is complying or uh, the carrier is uh, complying as well. So as of right now, the, the plane ride experience, how, it, how it's really set up is that you know, if you decide you want to travel somewhere, you book your flight, um, you get the health certificate for your pet, you get the crate for your, your shipping crate, and get a, you might need a certificate of acclimation if the animal is being, if, again, a certain temperature level or, or uh, below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, it's needed. So this is how it goes. Um, you check in, the airline takes over, and then it delivers your pet to the final destination. And if there's a positive outcome, you never really hear about anything positive, but if it's a negative outcome, it, it gets a lot of media attention, which impacts the airline and the airline industry. There's a loss of consumer confidence. And I personally think it's led to more of the fraudulent emotional support animals being brought in cabin in the United States. Either way, the whole plane ride experience itself, the way it is right now, there's a lack of focus on the animal and animal welfare. And there's a, the, right now there's a, there's a big myth of pet travel. Uh, and the myth is that there's so many adverse events involving pet transportation. And you would think so hearing all the negative uh, stories. Well, it's not even a whole lot, but when, you, when it happens, it's sensationalized in, in uh, news media. 
But in fact, uh, in 2017, there was only 40 incidents out of say 507,000 animals being transported, which is, uh, my way, which is less than 0.8%. Uh, in 2018, the number dropped, as you can notice, the number of animals being transported dropped to 425,000 around there, and there was only 17 incidents, which is less than 0.4%. So the headlines make it seem like it's larger than what it is, but when you, in all actuality, it really isn't. I reviewed some data uh, with the Department of Transportation. I actually reviewed the data, um, is there the Department of Transportation airline incident reports um, from 2016 through 2018. And um, for 2016, there were 26 deaths. And of those deaths, uh, in parentheses, there were, uh, there were 14, basically of those deaths, I looked at the reports and found that um, there were, these animals actually died of pre-existing medical conditions. And then in, for injuries in 2016, there were 22 injuries, but of those, 14 were related to an animal trying to escape from their crate. So as, as far as saying incidents, airline, maybe potentially that the airline was involved with it, it can be adjusted down to say 20 incidents, which actually can be adjusted to just maybe 0 0.39 out of 10,000 animals being transported during 26. So the numbers, numbers are actually very lower than, than um, if you adjust for animals with pre-existing medical conditions or injuries related to escapes. They did the same thing for 2017 and 2018. And as you can see, each year the numbers have gone down because there is uh, the federal, well, airlines have been becoming more restrictive as far as what's being transported by cargo. And also in the US, what happened instead is a lot more animals were being transported in cabin. So as I said, an analysis of the DOT report, and if you ever want to look it up, the information's here. Um, it's readily available online. You can see, uh, get access to how each U.S. airline is doing as far as animal transportation. And again, when I analyzed the data, I was looking at animals that had uh, deaths due to pre-existing medical conditions, such as heart disease, respiratory disease, um, hypoglycemia in puppies, uh, young puppies such as the little teacup little uh, puppies. Um, those animals who do not tolerate animal transportation or travel very well in cargo because of the, they have to be fed frequently. And that sometimes depending on if they're traveling internationally, um, that would be very difficult to do. Uh, and then also, as I said, there are injuries due to ex attempting to escape their crate. So ways to improve live animal transportation and, and as far as the, I believe veterinary involvement is needed in the animal transportation process in itself um, within the airline industry um, and also in the transportation regulatory agencies and associations and here in the U.S. that will be the U.S. Department of Transportation and also internationally with the I, IATA. I think that to prepare pets for transport, we need to, uh, there needs to be more shipper and owner and veterinary involvement regarding that um, to ensure that they're safe in travel. So it goes as far as purchasing the crate, having them acclimated to the crate, making sure they're healthy and fit to fly and also at booking. And then also there's other aspects here I'll discuss a, bit, a little bit later with the airline industry and a shipper and owner, uh, things that could be done there. But I wanna dive into specific things here that potentially veterinarians can share with uh, their pet owners or um, animal shippers regarding preparation for air transport for pets. And this in itself is going to focus on the health and welfare of the animal. You want to make sure uh, uh, pets are being shipped in IATA compliant crates. And um, here in the US, it's kind of difficult because um, on the commercial market, uh, an individual can go and try to purchase the correct crate at say a PetSmart or something like that. And 
it, the crate will be labeled that it's airline compliant, but it isn't. Um, at one point, there was um, some uh, crate companies that were fraudulently putting that they were IATA compliant crates, but IATA does not uh, endorse any manufacturing company or anything regarding that. But either way, the crate has to be um, held together with nuts and bolts. There must be ventilation on, the, uh, on these three sides. Um, ventilation cannot be on the bottom, so the bottom has to be solid. Um, there has to be a locking mechanism in place um, with the pins, and actually there, there, there's a measurement of the pins at least 1.6 centimeters within there. It must, either way, that, that there's, there's compliance issues there that has to be met with the locking me mechanism. And also the, the importance of crate size. Uh, to ensure animals, um, well, to comply with USDA's Animal Welfare Act regulations, the crate must have enough size, enough space, I'm sorry, for the pet to turn about normally, stand normally without touching the head or ears touching the top of the crate, um, and also lie in a natural position. Uh, this table here below, it gives it, and, and this goes for cats too, uh, this to me, this diagram below gives the impression that cats don't have to stand, uh, but they do. They should also be able to stand in the crate and move about and not feel uh, cramped inside a crate. This is extremely important during transport. And please, I apologize for this. I have no idea why it's going so slow. Um, but how would you like to be confined? Of course, this is uh, clip art, but how would you like to be confined in a crate? Uh, and not able to move around um, for a journey would not be good. And again, it's a violation of USDA's Animal Welfare Act. Also, there's a risk of injury, escape, or death for the animal. Imagine they would try to get out of that, uh, being confined like that. Um, so, um, and also, it will exacerbate any pre-existing medical condi conditions a pet may have, such as separation anxiety, arthritis, and again, if it has a heart problem or a res respiratory problem. Um, so crate size matters and crate design matters. There, there's a lot of crates out there on the market in the U.S., on the commercial market that has, I mean, it's fancy, they're cute, but um, they may have double doors or openings. There's um, double doors or openings on the top. Those are not comp uh, airline compliant. Um, Soft-sided carriers such as here, that is not acceptable. Um, and I don't even think that's acceptable for in-cabin carrying uh, uh, regulations as far as what you can travel because there's not enough ventilation areas for the animals. Wire crates are not compliant. The crates that have ventilation on the lower half do not meet IATA reg uh, regulations. And then also crates that are being held together with plastic clips, plastic pegs, or just little, little uh, latches, those are, do not meet IATA standards, but again, they're, they're quite prominent here in the U.S., um, and I think it's common for folks to carry their pets maybe to the veterinary clinic with those, but they're not ideal for transport by cargo. Another feature to prepare, prepare a pet for transport is crate acclimation. You want to make sure they're acclimated to the crate. It's unfortunate sometimes it'd be the first time a pet has ever confined in a crate and they're, they're shipped and then uh, folks wonder why the pets may, you know, have, may, have, may have been trying to break out of the crate or, or trying to escape because they've never been in the crate before. They're not acclimated to it. So it's very important that this is done. Uh, you must start slowly, um, be patient with them and make the crate normal for them. Don't make it into a punishment. Um, and after they're comfortable with this whole process, might be good to take the, the, the pet in the crate and take the travel places with them to get them comfortable with just the movement and the, just the transitions between, um, I guess, different environments being inside the crate inside your vehicle. But there's a video by United Airlines that actually defines uh, what you should do and actually is very good to follow. And another major thing is you want to make sure the pet is healthy enough to fly. And it's interesting to me is that um, when uh, you, the, the assumption is a health certificate that's needed for travel means the animal is healthy, but actually it doesn't mean that. 
The health certificate is actually the certificate of veterinary inspection. It says it basically means that the pet needs, meets the requirements for that destination state or country. And that could be a vaccination requirement of saying rabies vaccination is required or other vaccinations are required. But it's not touching upon the medical health and history of that animal. If the pet has an underlying condition, it can be exacerbated during transport. If the breed, if the certain breeds, brachycephalic breeds or snub nosed breeds, these breeds have a condensed facial structures and they are very prone to developing to, well, they're prone to overheating and developing heat stroke um, during transport. A lot of airlines have embargoed brachycephalic breeds because of that, because of the safety of safety, animal safety and, and welfare of the, you know, the animal. So um, it's very important that uh, veterinarians share this information with their clients um, to ensure uh, and maybe advise another method for transport for that pet. The age of animals are significant because in the young, as I mentioned earlier, hypoglycemia is common in the toy breeds. Um, so um, you have to find ways to ensure that these animals are either maybe transported when they're a little bit older, um, where they're not so um, dependent on uh, short feeding periods or something like that, but there, you have to come up with ways to ensure that these animals safe when are safe when transport. The older pets have pre -exist, a lot of pre-existing medical conditions. Sometimes it's unknown, you don't realize it, but I mean, a 17-year-old cat being transported by cargo, um, you know, you might want to consider maybe that's not the best thing for it to do, uh, for it to be transported that way. Uh, the weight of the animal does matter um, during transport, and you could, uh, veterinarians can advise uh, their clients that say if it's your pet is underweight, colder weather, transport it during mid, -por mid portion of the day where it's a little bit warmer, um, and find ways to supplement that animal. A lot of carriers, airline carriers, do not allow the animals to wear shirts or uh, sweaters while they're in the crate because of the potential of it getting snagged on something inside of it and everything. And also, true enough too, even though they're underweight, they can still overheat. Uh, if they're overweight animals, you'd want to, uh, and they're tra being transported during um, warmer weather, you want to make sure it's early morning, early later evening. So give advice upon that, basically. And again, as I mentioned previously, the health of the animal does matter. Review the medical history. Uh, of a pet prior to transportation. Um, you want to find out if the animal requires daily medication. Is it a diabetic, need, need insulin? Some of these pets are probably not good candidates for being transported by air car by cargo. Um, you want to find out if it has any uh, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, a history of seizures or uh, uh, arthritis. These are all conditions you need to consider. And then also whether the pet is pregnant, you don't want to ship a uh, close to term pregnancy animal because of the risk of it either uh, uh, giving birth during travel or aborting. And a little bit more detail about the brachycephalic breeds. Uh, they're, they had the normal structures as any other dog would have, but they're condensed. So because of that, they have an elongated soft palate their uh, nares are normally uh, stenotic, and they have inverted laryngeal saccules. Um, and basically, they have the difficulty of dissipating heat through panting. And, um, and because of that, they are prone to developing um, heat stress and heat stroke and will, will not do well during transport. And then, unfortunately, can die during transport. The unfortunate thing I've noticed uh, with working with Delta is that quite often, Pet owners would ask their veterinarian to misre mis misrepresent the breed on the health certificate, which was a really bad thing because potentially you're putting that pet at risk. Uh, these three animals here, um, the one on the top uh, was mentioned as being a Weimaraner puppy, and that's a Weimaraner puppy below, but actually it was a pretty little gray little uh, French bulldog. Uh, the middle one is they said they kept mentioning that there were Patterdale Terriers, and actually it was a pit bull terrier that was being transported. And pit bulls, no, they're not brachycephalic, but they are a very strong breed and have the ability to tear out of crates very easily. So, for the safety of the animal and the safety of the folks that are handling these animals during transport, a lot of times these breeds are 
embargo. And one to the right, they had mentioned the dog was a chihuahua, and actually that was a breed there, and actually it looks like it could be potentially a pit bull mix. So basically this slide is just to show, please don't misrepresent the breed. Um, advise clients on the, that it's very important for the safety of the animal to not do that. And at booking, at booking, things that uh, veterinar veterinarians can do to help their clients is just make sure they're aware that each airline has their own individual policies. Actually, it's, it's kind of unfortunate uh, that in the U.S., policies for Delta or for United Airlines or for American Airlines, as far as their live animal policies, varies. So it makes it a little bit difficult for the, the customer to, uh, when planning their trips with their pets and everything, but that's how it is right now. So they have to realize that there's going to be some variations on that. Um, and with all airlines in the U.S., sedation is not allowed. And um, also the regulatory requirements to, for travel, and this is in addition to the health certificate, be aware, depending on where you are in the, in the United States or wherever you're traveling in the United States, um, Hawaii is a little bit more stricter because Hawaii is a rabies-free state. So the requirements there are more stringent than going to say, for instance, Georgia. Um, and international travel is a big topic. I actually recently gave a, a presentation on that. It's a very detailed, uh, it's a lot of detail when you're traveling internationally with your pet. Um, in the U.S., you can look at the USDA pet travel website. That might give you a, a help with it, but honestly, you would need assistance with international travel um, because the uh, repercussions, if you make a mistake, are you can be, pet can be denied entry and sent back to the country of origin, um, mandatory quarantine if it's available, or um, humane euthanasia would be an option. So you need to get that right. And then if you're coming into the U.S., just be aware that you must comply with USDA's, uh, CDC's um, dog importation regulation. Okay, I want to pause a minute and um, go over a case that recently happened fairly recently. I think it happened in, yeah, it was in June. Um, an airline from Ukraine landed at, an, at a Canadian airport and it had approximately 500 French Bulldog puppies on board within cargo. Uh, the shipping containers contain one to two puppies per crate. There were, upon arrival, there were 38 puppies were dead and many others were sick with uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and dehydration. During loading in Ukraine, it was stated that the temperatures were as high as 91 degrees Fahrenheit. And in response to the deaths, the airline cited calculated risk. Well, this is a really, really big case. Um, really very interesting to me. And it just really, in my opinion, just showed that how veterinary involvement was truly needed to prevent this from happening. Um, number one, I think I can, I can see is number one, I'm really surprised that there was that such a large number of animals being shipped at one time. That's huge. But again, I don't know how things are done elsewhere, but that's, that's a large number of animals. Um, IATA requirements will allow one to, up to two puppies per crate, but the crates must have the, the sizing large enough for both of them to move about properly um, and everything. So if you have two animals in there, they, they still have to move about and have enough space in there. So I wonder if the shipping container requirements were met for these puppies. Um, the fact that these pets were loaded when the temperatures were as high as 91 degrees Fahrenheit here in the U.S., um, I believe the USDA's regulations say it can't be higher than 85 degrees Fahrenheit for, for like 45 minutes. So it already exceeds what here in the U.S., again, I don't know other countries, but I imagine animal welfare regulations were not met regarding the loading of these animals. So having a veterinarian in place to ensure this is being, uh, being complied with or that animal transportation policies are implemented is very important for uh, animal transportation. And also, I wonder um, if these pets were healthy and fit for travel in the first place because uh, this whole process in itself um, 
it, it just shouldn't have happened this way. It just makes me wonder if they were not well, some of them were not well in the, in the, in before, before travel. So with that in mind, uh, back to my flow chart that I love, um, I think there's some areas that, um, that there are areas of improvement that can, things that can be done to improve the entire travel outcome process for animals, I think is needed. And it's gonna involve the, the pet industry plus the shipper owner and veterinarians. And I'll go further discussing as far as the airline industry and the shipper and owner again, those things there. So again, veterinary involvement is needed to improve the outcome. One thing I've noticed um, I personally think um, needs, needs to be upgraded is that the design of pet travel crates over the years have not changed. They're kind of the standard look uh, with them. There's few crates on the actual commercial market, market that actually meets IATA's uh, live animal regulation standards for air travel. There are very few, but as you can see, and I've labeled um, a little bit more Again, they have a locking mechanism. They have a solid bottom. They have nuts and bolts holding the top and lower portions. And it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be two portions to the crate, but either if there are pieces of the crates, they have to be held together by nuts and bolts. Uh, the ventilation and a solid top. That's what the standard requirements for IATA. And personally, I think they need to improve upon that as far as the standards. The only, uh, only crate that I know that exceeds IATA standards that's on the, that's on the commercial market, well, not on the commercial market, was, it was available through Delta as a premium product was the CarePod. And I advise you to please uh, look into that further. The design on this crate was extremely uh, well done. Uh, the crate, the CarePod has a internal watering system. Um, you can actually fill the water, fill, fill water there so the animals always have access to water. Uh, has a triple locking mechanism system with it, with hinges. Um, it has, uh, it's, it's just double layer of plastic. So in, in a sense, kind of insulated from outside temperatures, the pets are kept warm. And it also has a GPS tracking system. I'm probably not doing justice as far as describing it, but I can tell you this is one of the best um, pet carriers that are, that was available through Delta. Other veterinary involvement um, with animal shippers. Um, we need to work with uh, animal associations to educate and ensure compliance with animal welfare and IATA regulations during air travel to ensure that everyone is aware of the, the policies and procedures. And working with, um, in the US, working with the American Veterinary Medical Association, uh, American Kennel Club with, uh, with breeders, uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to uh, touch upon uh, zoo animals and uh, aquatic animals being transported, um, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, uh, National Animal Interest Alliance, and also uh, the International Pet and Animal Transportation Association. Another thing I think that needs to be done is um, we need to work with a lot of hu the humane societies that uh, rescue pets. Uh, a lot of times um, either they're transport them domestically or internationally. Um, here to the US, working with them to make sure they're aware of the uh, IATA regulations to ensure the animals are being transported safely. It's very important. And as far as my fellow veterinarians, things that uh, input that they can give to assist in the animal transportation process is um, provide recommendations to pet owners. Um, regarding the, the well-being of the animal. If you see a pet that has an underlying health condition, you don't feel that it's best interest for it to travel, then say so. Uh, maybe put it in a record. I mean, true enough, it is a person's responsibility if they decide to go ahead and transport the animal, but they need to be educated about the risk they're taking. Uh, help develop criteria to de determine if a pet is fit to fly. That would be extremely important, again. Um, to again promote animal safety and animal welfare. If it's fit, just developing that criteria would be a big help. And also 
determine if, if sedation is not allowed, then help determine which medications can be used to calm the pet that does not cause sedation. And at booking, things again you can help with is just, again, increase the awareness for the pet owners about the requirements for travel, be aware of the destination and country uh, animal entry requirements, and with a busy schedule for veterinarians, it might really, services are probably need to, needed to assist veterinarians and pet owners to prepare for domestic and um, international travel. Now within the airlines, and this is something that's near and dear to me, and I thank Delta for the opportunity to be able to uh, get an insight. Uh, Delta already had a lot of great policies in place, um, and I guess I was there just to help help them keep it pushing forward. But um, you need a veterinarian on staff. In the U.S., again, Delta was the only U.S. airline that hired a veterinarian, hired myself. But airlines need a veterinarian on staff to help review their live animal policies and procedures. Um, within that, you have to also review the, the, the training that's given to the agents. Um, you need to help reinforce and develop live animal emergency response procedures. Um, and this is responding to if there's a sick animal, if, uh, if there's an injury, escape, or a death. You have to respond to all those at every hub and every destination location. And this is going to require having animal transporters available and also being associated with veterinary clinics or hospitals associated with them. But that has to be in place to ensure the animals are safe or if any, in the event of any emergency, the animals are being responded to properly. You also must, be, must monitor your whole process for compliance and develop methods to ensure compliance such as job aids. You have to go to site visits and monitor for check-in procedures. Your dog here is um, brought in. It's in a compliant crate. It's held together with nuts and bolts, solid bottom, ventilation on the top. Um, the, you have a nice uh, locking mechanism here and it place zip ties in place. That's usually an airline policy itself, but zip ties are in place. So it's the uh, um, not, no, releasable zip ties place in place to ensure um, the animal as a second security for these crates. And even monitoring um, as the agents move the animals to plane side, review the, the loading and unloading procedures and the staging procedures, getting the animal to the aircraft and back. Um, and then after they're loaded, just making sure everything is in order as far as them being loaded in the cargo hold. And just be aware the cargo hold itself is just a space, it's like a crawl space. Um, it may contain um, other cargo items, other items is transmitted by cargo, which could be perishable items, um, and, and um, perishable items basically, and um, sometimes luggage as well. So there's other items there. There's no communication between cabin space, in cabin, and the cargo hold of an aircraft. These, in the U.S. as far as I know. So being able to tend to an animal during transport, during flight, is, it's not, not possible. And also be aware, I'm sorry, the, the agents are trained to monitor the animals throughout this whole process to monitor them for knowing what to, if the animal is in distress. And again, if the animal is in distress, they will alert the emergency response um, process. And also at destination, again, you have to go to site visits and check and see what it looks like when an animal arrives to their destination and policies and procedures there. I think it would be a great help if uh, during, if after each flight, uh, airlines gave out uh, surveys to the shippers or the pet owners to get input and provide questions and responses. And either way, it would allow an opportunity or an analysis of the experiences of the services that were provided. And the feedback will allow improvement of services if, if, if you know, will allow improvement of services. 
And also, as I mentioned, uh, veterinary involvement in the transportation regulatory agencies or associations are needed. Um, we need to be, as veterinarians, we need to provide input regarding policies that impact the transportation of live animals. And I look at it this way as saying, almost the same as if you have a zoo, you have a zoo veterinarian there on behalf of the animals there. If you have an aquarium, you have an, uh, basically a veterinary aquatic uh, veterinarian there to take care of the, the aquatic animals. So in the animal in, uh, transportation, if you're transporting animals, a veterinarian should be involved to ensure uh, animal welfare uh, regulations are being met and they're arriving to their destination safely. So in conclusion, I main thing is follow the complete plane ride experience in preparing pets for travel. We need to work with pet crate manufacturers to improve the design of airline compliant crates. Uh, we need to work with an associations to educate veterinarians and animal shippers uh, and establish criteria for fitness supply and also give recommendations to pet owners on whether the animal should, should fly or not. We also need veterinary input to define the medications that can be used that will calm the pet but will not sedate them. And we also need to increase the awareness of uh, requirements for pet travel. Within the airlines, Veterinary oversight is needed of their live animal transportation programs. We need to be there to review and provide the policies regarding the transportation of live animals and monitor them closely to ensure that they arrive to their, their destination safely. And we also need to work within the transportation uh, regulatory agencies and associations and provide input uh, regarding the policies that impact the, the transportation of live animals. you have any questions, that's it for me today. Any questions? Hi. Hi, Nelva. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's a very informative and interesting and educative um, and practical presentation. We already have a lot of... Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes I hear yes. you. Yes. Yeah, I think we already have so many audience comments in the chat box that the presentation is brilliant. So thank you very much. Um, although, for, for example, for me, I only had the little um, 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 a puppy for a few weeks. I already been thinking about how to fly with it. <laughs> so yeah. it's really helpful for me. Um, I'm sure more helpful for the rest of the audience. So um, I've been collect a few questions from the chat box. Um, and also later, our, ex our panda will um, pick an uh, audience who raised their hand and try to um, answer their questions. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, let me share the question, the couple of questions we had already. Um, um, can you see? Yes. yes. I think there's three questions regarding the uh, citation. Uh, Xwell Pender? It's your turn, Pender. <laughs> Say it again, sorry. No, no, I'm just asking our Axel Pender. He's oh, responsible hello. for this session. <laughs> hello, oh. Axel Pender Hi. here. <laughs> hello, hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, so, so we'll go through some of the questions from the chat box, then, then we will, we, we will, um, We'll start uh, um, on mute uh, on the audience who are recently right. asked, so that they can bring up well, their questions. Okay, so, regarding sedation, sedation yeah. is normally not allowed because it basically it diminishes the respiratory rate and the heart rate during. And if you're at higher elevations, it's not ideal for the animals uh, to be sedated. In a sense, their normal ability to to um, accommodate to the changes in pressures and everything is going to be diminished and it, it's you don't want that to happen you want it's almost well you don't want that to happen so their normal ability to compensate for the higher altitude and pressures will now be diminished because they're sedated so sedation is not allowed i see i see 
and and so let let me uh, unmute someone and some of the the other questions in. I'm trying. Do you, uh, how do you want me to do this? So oh, no, I'll, I'll I'll do it. I'm just unmuting someone. So so while we're waiting, so we can go through some of the other questions. So uh, okay. For example, for how uh, for how much distance a public can travel via airline? Say, say it again. Uh, so, so if you look at oh, how much distance yeah. that yeah. I can't I, uh, that information will vary by airline. Each airline will have will determine the length of travel for theirs their uh, for animals without a stop in between. Um, I I cannot give you an exact answer to that unfortunately because it varies by airline. Oh, that's but again, and that goes back to saying yes, that information should be standardized, but it isn't. Oh, okay. So have to always check the uh, the airline's guidance. Yes. Yes. I see. I see. That's good too. <laughs> so so I've unmuted Doctor um, Ifsa Shama. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, good evening, sir. Hi, hi. So you're welcome to to ask your question here. Okay, good evening, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, my question is that uh, I have recently graduated from uh, graduated in BBSC degree. Uh, so my question is that how can a veterinarian proceed to be a part of airline industry? Um, I, I think what probably needs to be done is you need to probably uh, really be honest with you. I was very lucky and blessed for the opportunity that I have because I was looking on LinkedIn. <laughs> And I found the advertisement from Delta uh, advertising that they needed a veterinarian. And I was lucky um, to, to, to find it and apply for it and was uh, you know, blessed with the opportunity. Um, I'm hoping over time that if I continue to advocate for veterinarians in the airline industry, I'm hoping over time that other veterinarians will see the, the benefit of it. I definitely know that Delta definitely saw the benefit of it. If it weren't for COVID-19, I'd be working with Delta right now. They definitely saw the benefit of having a veterinarian. So we just need to show our value and what we can do in the profession, in the field, to promote animal safety and animal welfare. And I think with that, there'll be more opportunities in the future. But I can't, honestly, I can't tell you the avenue to take to get exactly into the airline industry. Um, just keep your eyes open for the opportunity, basically. Yeah, thank you. And mm -hmm. we, we have uh, um, Muhammad Amon Bashar. Hello. Yes, I am here. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, this session was really amazing. Oh, thank My you. question is that if animal is furious and they are fighting to fly in the airline, uh, you can already say that we can use any sedative uh, due to the respiratory problem. Then what medication we can use for calm, calming that animal or we can calm that or you can say that we can uh, put down from the stress that animal i think you have a wonderful question there that's something where um i am not i i've, I've practiced clinical medicine i'm going back into doing clinical things now but i am not familiar with the uh, medications fairly newer medications that are out that will just offer a calming effect and not a set sedative <laughs> a sedation for animals so I'm not sure but then that's where we need input from the veterinary profession on hey what can we use what's the be best thing to use so a uh, great question that's a good question I had myself thank you and next one uh, Joshua Joshua okay hello hi can you hear me ma yes I do I hear you all right, thank you so much, Dr. Bryant. I, I, it was such an educative and innovative section, actually. I have some questions here with me, Ma. Uh, you spoke about uh, um, the sedation, which I got the reason why uh, the animal shouldn't be sedated. But, Ma, in cases where we have uh, such aggressive pets, you, 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 you may run into dogs that are so aggressive and even cats that are so, so aggressive, and you just have to transport them. So then, if we don't sedate them, uh, what, 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 we, uh, what, what, what we come of such animals? Because uh, transporting them would be so difficult since they are so Well, 
Um, you have to think also about so addressing uh, if if um, there are agree. So how then do we go about coming them? And I, I know I find it difficult to understand. Can, can you hear me? I'm having difficulty. Okay, hello. I hear you now. Okay, can you hear me now, man? Yes, yes, I hear All you. Right. All right. I, I, did you get my first question, ma'am? Um, I heard about the aggressive animals, very uh, dangerous, yes. aggressive, dangerous yes. animals. Um, yes. Since, yes, since we are not by regulations, since by regulations we are not allowed to sedate them, then how do we calm such animals down so that we can transport okay. them successfully? Then secondly, ma'am, um, um, I discover you spoke much about um, the small animals, the pets, the dogs and cats and all of that. Then uh, what of large animals? In cases where we have to transport um, animals like the equine species, can we also uh, succeed in transporting them? Is that possible? Do we have crates that can curtail them and contain them? Then there was a case you spoke about, the case of uh, nightmare puppies, where uh, about 500 uh, puppies were transported. I guess I, I, I would like to say possibly the reason why some of them died was that um, choosing to transport uh, more than two or even uh, three, four puppies in one single crate. Ma, will you advise that? Shouldn't that also be prohibited, trying to transport more than one puppies in one crate, irrespective of the size of the crate, ma? Yes. Um, let's see, you gave me a lot of questions, but yes. As far as transporting large animals or dangerous animals, the IATA, LAR, the Live Animal Regulations Manual, has stipulations on all of that. Even for dangerous dogs, there's a, a larger, a different crate that's uh, recommended for them. Um, okay. So there, there's ways to contain dangerous animals um, during transport, but sedation still is not, definitely not um, kind of... Uh, recommend it and everything and a lot of airlines won't allow it so for a dangerous dog then you need stronger containment is the thing that you would have to work on be aware uh -huh. yes transporting all other animals the iata live animal regulation manuals give the stipulations on the transport of cattle horses and everything shipping container requirements all that information is in that manual yeah okay. so all it's right. possible it's possible okay okay Thank did I answer so much, everything? Ma. Did I answer everything for you? Yes, you did, ma. You did, ma. Thank you so much. Ma. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So next one, um, Nicole. Hello, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 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 I would like to ask first because I'm from the Philippines and um. Having pets transported into um, airlines is not that of a common in here. Are very seldom um, done because first is it's really pricey. So I would like to ask if um, uh, um what do you call this one? You you mentioned about the there are rates that are IAT LA are um standards. I would like to ask if they are um, so applied to other airlines in the whole world. I, I'm sorry. I direct those, uh, those um, this of crates also when traveling pets. I'm really having a difficult time understanding you. Say it one more time, please. I, I think the internet is a bit... Uh... Yeah, yeah, um, I would like to ask <laughs> if um, the other airline companies, sites, the airline companies in the US, also, of uh, course, APA AR standard yes. um, rates for traveling. Yes, all, all airlines, all US airlines, well, actually, internationally, the IATA uh, standards um, apply for all um, international basis, international standards and everything for as far as the crate requirements and what have you. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. I'm sorry. I really, we're having difficulty of, of your, it's like, I don't know what it is, but I can't really understand you fully, but did I answer your question? I hope I did. 
Yes, I, I have another question. Um, yes. If, for example, uh, like, uh, there are cases that pets that day on that partition, right? Uh, well, um, when will the uh, responsibility fall in hands? Within the owner or within the airline company? Um, Nicole? Hello? Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, somebody spoke. I, yeah, I'll tweet um, it again. Um, in case of death, because of partition, of will it okay. be the... Uh, responsibility of the airline or responsibility of the owner or responsibility of the well, veterinarian? If, if there's a death, um, in the U.S., if there's a death, it's usually, it's investigated by, um, it's, the information is turned over to the U.S. Department of Transportation, then the USDA Animal Welfare will investigate the situation. Now, what, what we did um, is that if there were a death, a death happened, we ensured that the animal was taken to a separate diagnostic pathology laboratory to, to, to determine the cause of death and kind of get the whole case together to figure out what happened. Um, we wanted to know what happened. Um, in instances, when I was there and the stuff I've seen, there was always an underlying condition with the animal, either, um, like I said, it was an unexpected condition. I remember uh, it wasn't, uh, I remember a situation where it, the pet had a, it was a puppy and it had a congenital heart disease that no one would have known about, but that was the cause of death. So in every situation that happens, it's rare, but you want to investigate and determine the cause of death. Because if it's related to something that happened during transport, then that's an opportunity for the airline to make changes to their policy so it doesn't happen again. And then if it's something underlying with the animal, um, there's things that need to be addressed there. Maybe the animals should not have been shipped. So something could be learned for the whole process itself, but we need to determine the cause of the issue, basically. But say who's at fault, it, it just all depends on the results of that necropsy report. It all depends. Ooh. Oh, well, thank you very much. Okay, so, so let's have some more questions mm -hmm. from the chat box. Sure. Yeah, so first one, should the cat be... Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah, there are a couple questions regarding the feedings, I think, they are, and also regarding topic how to calm them without citation and also with other animals. So I, I group them together. Thank you. That's great. I'm wondering though, at one point, can we maybe, if I can see this listing and maybe I can off, uh, offline respond to those and give them back and maybe you can put them in a blog or put them somewhere and we can respond to them that way. Um, oh, yes, that would be great. That would be great. <laughs> then you will probably yeah, expect I think, 200 yeah. of them. <laughs> it will be, well, maybe, but it, it may be, I'll put it in a spreadsheet and respond to them, but I think it'd be a whole lot more effective if I did it that way than kind of verbally yes, this yes, way. That, you tell, yeah, that is why we started this um, consultation <laughs> because mm -hmm. we have received so many questions that, but we don't have time to address all of them. Yeah, yeah, but no, I'm willing. I'm, I'm willing to offline uh, respond to those. But uh, oh, again, you tell you me how you want to do it. Do oh, I already respond? see some audience show their thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, that would be better. Okay, that would be great. Um, so I'm willing to do that. Um, so do you want to keep going with questions, or what do you want me to do? Uh, so, would you like to uh, take live questions, or um, sure. live discussions? I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe live discussion first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, w what's your time time uh, timetable? Like, uh, are you available in the next couple of minutes? So, I'm. I'm. A, how long I mean, I'm. A, to stay for uh, the questions. Um, why don't we go to questions till um, ten thirty? I don't know. It's up to you guys. Oh, uh, sounds good. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, okay, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, okay, let, let me just uh, put the puppy down and then uh -huh. put the baby up <laughs> mm -hmm. so he doesn't cry. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Let, let me, uh, so I've been trying to unmute uh, Habibu. Habibu, hello. Habibu. Habibu, hello Habibu. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me, Yes, I, I hear you. Yes. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Ram, for the presentation. The first thing here is that for a booking time, how much do you get to book a, to book a flight for the for the fed? And how do you go about feeding during transportation in air? For example, in the transport will take like two hours or three hours. How do you go about the feed for the fed? That is my question. As feeding, I believe they were supposed to be, they should feed them at least four hours prior to flight. Around there, four hours prior to flight, you don't want to do it too immediate, close to the flight because the potential of them basically eliminating during transport. So I believe it's about four, at least four hours before the flight, have a small meal. One recommendation is because actually, you know, they do well without food that as far as the animal welfare requirement, they need to have water given to them. A recommendation we give folks is if they have a water, you have the water dish has to be fixed inside the crate. Freeze the water in there overnight and put it in there so they'll have all constant access to water. Because if you put water in there, they're going to drink it all or it'll spill out and they won't have anything. But as far as animal welfare regulations, feeding is required every during transport um pets should be fed at least every 24 hours or well 12 12 hours for younger than six months but water is the main thing that's that's an animal wolf required they require every 12 hours they must have water given to them and since again like we mentioned earlier there's no way for them to connect between the cabin itself and into cargo if you want water a water source for the animal freeze the water in a um, water tray and everything so they'll have constant access to it but even, even with that, no animal is going to die. Say if your flight is eight hours, they're not going to get dehydrated and die in eight hours. It doesn't happen. Unless there's some underlying condition with that animal. Did I answer you? I hope I answered your question. Yes, you have answered my question. Any further? Thank you. Thank you. And let's move on to the next one. Just trying to unmute some people. Hmm. So, so, hi, Gabriel. Gabriel, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, sir. Yeah. The, the volume is a bit low, but we, we can hear you a little. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, Hello, sir. It's much better now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Hello, ma. I really Hi. appreciate the lecture. The, oh, thank you. The presentation, the presentation is so educative. I really appreciate it. Ma, my oh, question you. is this, ma. Uh, during transportation, is it advisable to administer anti to a pet before transporting them in order to prevent uh, motion sickness? Thank you, ma. To, to, to administer what again? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Administer what? Hello, ma. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. I yeah, hear you. I, I said. I said. Okay. I said. Is it advisable to administer antiemetics to prevent the uh, motion sickness during um, transportation of pets? I think that sounds like a good plan as long as the antiemetic does not cause sedation. Uh, I think it will be great. Um, it, it would definitely help. It really the process with them really is just to calm them down unless the pet has a, you know, I mean, true enough, uh, when they're stressed, they may vomit and everything. But as far as the motion itself, um, I think it's more as they get more stressed about the new environment. Think about it when they're being transported on airport grounds, they're around machinery. Um, you know, think of all the things that are tr being transported there. There's carts going through with baggage, all these different sounds. 
smells and everything they're exposed to, I think is the stress of the whole thing. It's not necessarily the motion. Once they get inside the cargo hold, you know, they're not shifting and flying across the, the you know, the carrier is not shifting across the cargo hold. They're kind of like the last, usually how they're prepared for travel is they're the last one, last item that's put in a cargo hold. So they're like pushed up against things, they're put in place, so they're not shifting around. So I don't think really a, it's a motion thing with them. I think it's just the stress and it scares them kind of thing, and more anxiety with it. But true enough, vomiting can come with, you know, as a result of the anxiety, but I don't think it's truly a situation of motion um, that's impacting the pets during transport. And again, that's just my thoughts of just visualizing the process. But we, again, we do need assistance from our, within our veterinary field um, for, for expertise on medication that can cause, uh, calm them down, but, the, but will not cause sedation. Did I answer you? I hope I did. Yes. Um, we lost him. Do, do we still have him? I hope I answered. Well, yeah. okay. So we have uh, Saga. Hi, Saga. Can you hear us? Saga Chandra. Hello. Um, it's unmuted, but it's not answering back. So I'll, I'll try someone else. Okay. Hmm. Well, uh, meanwhile, while we are waiting, um, can I ask if you have any questions for the audience? So I can yeah. put in the feedback form so they can give you some answers. Do you have any questions? Uh, let's see. I would be curious about the animal welfare regulations in uh, different countries. Uh, if they're um, enforced or not during transport. That, that's something I would be curious to learn. Uh, just different countries. Now, honestly, I love, I think, X while for this opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't say it earlier, but thanks everyone for this opportunity to share my information on this basically as an international platform. What I would love to learn though is what are the animal uh, welfare regulations for animal transportation in different countries? I would love to learn that. Oh, that's a great question. I will put that in the, uh, uh, the, the feedback form. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, um... Shamavi, Mish, Shamavi, it's Shamavi. Sh Shamavi, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I would like to ask a question that um, generally the animals we transport are spayed. Okay. okay. So um, some uh, breeders require um, like unspayed or uh, natural. Um, animals so how can you transport them because uh, easter cycle can occur at any time like uh, like in bitches uh, they are uh, like uh, mono easters animals so uh, what uh, are your precautions regarding that because in easters they will like be restless and uh, uh, and that will hamper the transportation also i think so so what are the indications for that that, that is that is a great question the the IATA LAR does mention the fact that dogs in heat should not be transported, um, but it doesn't specify and go further how to determine or what, you know, it just says it shouldn't, you shouldn't transport dogs in heat. That, that's all it says. Again, let me go back to what I said during the presentation. We need to get more involved within the IATA, um, uh, within IATA and help define the live animal of uh, uh, regulations um, and, and kind of specify these things a little bit further. Um, I'm sorry I can't really comment too much on your question. I think it's a great question, but um, all that's really shared is don't basically ship a female, you know, a dog that's in heat, basically. So, uh, also, there is one more question I wanted to ask that um, uh, what is the minimum age for puppies to be transported ac across the uh, like um, uh, country? 
because uh, different countries have different uh, age specifications right yes so what is the like all all matlab um, how can you transport them all over the world without considering their um, age like what is the yeah. minimum age for that yeah that that goes back to again i, I wish i could, i wish there was a standard question answer response for that but there isn't and it varies by um well traveling internationally it varies by country a country might decide that they want the pet to be uh, vaccinated and, Im and fully immunized against rabies prior to coming to their country. So that means they have to be a lot older um, to do that up to say 15 to six weeks, 16 weeks of age to enter certain countries. Um, then also certain airlines might define that uh, they might have variations also on the age of transport for pets too. Uh, USDA's, I think we follow USDA's animal welfare regulations state they must be at least eight weeks of age to tr be transported. But again, it might it might vary that it will still vary by your country and your destination as well. So I, I wish there was a standard answer to that and it isn't. And yeah. Again, it goes to show that we need to standardize the processes and procedures for animal transportation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Good questions. Thank you. So let's see. I, I, I think the, the last one who raised the hand is not responding. Yep. So we've, we've been collecting some more questions which okay. we'll, we'll send it to you so, so if, in yeah case, i will yeah. i'll put them in a, i'll put them in a spreadsheet and send them back to you might take me a week uh probably about a week or so but i'll all get right. them done to you okay no rush thank you so much i, I yeah. think that's that's all the question we have like the okay great question. yeah so great i'll, I'll let xyc take over <laughs> great i really appreciate this opportunity yeah, so uh, l let me just, uh, I think, she, oh, she's muted. Uh, uh, I'm busy, <laughs> you take over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll take over then. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, so thank you so much, Nova. It was an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing lecture. And uh, I, I, as you can see from the chat box, lots of people mentioned it, it's this, so far the best presentation. They, this, they, attended so far they love it uh, thank you so much for the, the well and, and and i i don't know if i went but again i started out wanting to be a veterinary pathologist too so transitioned and i'm i feel like i'm using my background in veterinary pathology and still uh and just moving forward in just a different aspect because uh i love it yeah, yeah. that's all i can say it's definitely quite on you run uh, very important as well because like like people thought about transporting Transporting pets uh, through airline, but, but not not so many people know there's so much behind it need to be considered. Yes, yeah. thank you so much again. So as a tradition, so as a tradition, so before before we all finish, uh, so we will, uh, I will I will unmute all of you. So so um, <laughs> so let's everybody unmute yourself and turn on your video and let's say a big thank you to to Dr. Noah Bryant to, for for the amazing lecture today. <laughs> thank you very much, Ma. Thank you, 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. God bless you, Ma. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you for your time. It was good. Thank you. Thank you. Ma. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to see you all today. And thank you, you, thank you, you thank you. <laughs> yeah. See you all next time. So, bye. Thank you, Mike. Bye bye. Thank you, Hi everyone, I just shared a link uh, for our feedback form. So um, it has been very useful to have your voice. Uh, we learned a lot from your feedback. So uh, please take some time to fill that uh, feedback form. Thank you very much. So see you next time. So this is the end of our, um, I think, summer sessions, but we have more planned in the future. Already have one, I think, scheduled in September. Um, more coming, yeah? So thank you very much, take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Neva. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hi everyone, this, this is the end of today's session. So, so you're welcome to leave now. And uh, you, will, you will soon receive your certificates through your email really, really soon. So I, I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>